Hey, welcome back to Anti-King. Recently, I came across a movie on Netflix called Army of the Dead. Apparently, it's getting a lot of attention. People have loved it for the most part. And I can understand why. It is Zack Snyder's return to horror after his widely acclaimed, not by me, 2004 Dawn of the Dead remake. But without spoiling too much of what we'll be talking about later, it's not for me. And it got me thinking about uh, zombie media as a whole. As an avid horror fan, the zombie subgenre used to be one of my absolute favorites. But I feel like in recent years, it's turned out some absolute duds. So I wanted to take a look back at some older zombie classics and what made them great, as well as some newer ones and what I feel they're lacking, all through the lens of a recent zombie movie that I feel is the exception to the rule of bad recent zombie media, Planet Terror. But more on that later, let's dive right in. It was October 1st, 1968. At the height of the Vietnam War and on the downslope of the Civil Rights Movement, a small theater in Pittsburgh was set to premiere a local production company known as The Latent Images' first feature film. That company was run by none other than George A. Romero and John A. Russo, and that film was none other than Night of the Living Dead. And overnight, the modern zombie was born. The original iteration of zombie came from Haitian folklore, where they took shape as a corpse reanimated by uh, some magical means, usually, uh, often voodoo, hence the popular voodoo zombie idiom. It's unclear how exactly George Romero's creatures came to be known as zombies in the first place. In fact, Night of the Living Dead's characters never say the word zombie, instead referring to the film's antagonist as ghouls. Romero himself believes critics played a major role in that association, as many reviews had referred to them as zombies, and before long it was too late. It had entered a lexicon and created an entire subgenre and subculture of horror in its wake. That subculture would absolutely explode a decade later with the release of Dawn of the Dead. Dawn of the Dead was a sleeker product both stylistically and narratively, and its satire and message were much more pointed and intentional. It had the scale of a disaster movie, and its makeup and special effects are still praised to this day, more than 40 years after its release. While Night of the Living Dead is a masterpiece and became the bedrock its sequels would use to help expand its zombie lore, Dawn of the Dead was responsible for zombie subculture and what it would later become today. The series spawned a third classic, Day of the Dead, seven years later in 1985, in what I regard as my personal favorite zombie movie. Day of the Dead is the least talked about of the original three zombie movies and probably the least regarded. Although I think the inclusion of claustrophobic elements and the uncertainty of the human ego uh, helps add tension to an already precarious situation. You know, an apocalypse. The original Romero trilogy, to me, are the framework of what every zombie movie should be, or should try to be. So what, you may ask exactly, separates them from the more recent takes on zombies? And to me, it's a multitude of things. For one, the social commentary. Night of the Living Dead starred a black lead and prominently featured an interracial couple in 1968. That may not seem like much now, but it was an incredible risk at the time. In the movie, our black protagonist does everything right, or at least everything he can, to survive, only to be mistaken as a threat in the film's waning moments and murdered with indifference. This was released a mere six months after the murder of Martin Luther King, and still holds a powerful, if somewhat unintentional, statement on race relations in America. Dawn of the Dead, however, leaned into its message. Hard. Underneath the schlocky zombie film, it's a scathing take on consumerism and materialism and their place in our well-being. At the beginning of the American mall boom, it opened that we had been so conditioned by the material niceties of our daily lives that they had become an almost instinctual need on the level of food or water. When seeing the zombies wandering the mall, a character asks, what are they doing here? To which another character responds, it's just what they know. When you really dig into that, you can see just how creepy it is. These zombies have been stripped of all conscious thinking. They function basically only as nervous systems, with a constant unflinching desire for food. They run off their most base instincts, as mentioned in the film, and for a lot of people, those include consuming. Appropriately during the 80s, Day of the Dead gave us a blistering rebuke of the human ego and the dangers that ego can serve when coupled with power and desperation. Even with the world practically over and known survivors countable on your own two hands, these characters can't help but serve their own best interests. These timely and interesting social commentaries helped define these films and aided their common regard as classics. That being said though, these movies were meant to be fun. 
Social examinations aside, these three films provide all the over-the-top schlock and cheese you'd want from a zombie movie, with a bulk of that credit going to makeup effect mastermind Tom Zavining, providing vibrant, visceral gore effects. So where did it start to go wrong? Personally, I believe the very beginning started with the original Splinter in Night of the Living Dead's timeline. George A. Romero and John Russo disagreed on how to handle Knight's sequels, and thus split, deciding that all the titles with the phrase of the living dead would belong to Russo, and all with of the Dead would belong to Romero. Russo wrote Night sequels as a series of novels, which would later be adapted into a movie with 1985's The Return of the Living Dead. I want to be perfectly clear that I love this movie. I love the whole series for the most part and would absolutely consider it as a part of the classic era of zombie films. That being said, however, it changed several established uh, zombie tropes and later became the inspiration for a lot of zombie movies I can't stand. This movie was hugely influential culturally and ironically that was both one of its strengths and part of the problem. Return ditches a lot of the social commentary in favor of pandering cultural aesthetic that almost surely looks cooler with the benefit of hindsight. Like that shit probably didn't look all that cool back then. Not only that, but to me they committed the first instance of the zombie cardinal sin, making them fast and or strong. This type of zombie is so frustrating to me because it completely saps what's so scary about zombies in the first place. Imagine a deep sea picture of a vast, dark chasm. Now imagine just off the edge of the chasm, so minuscule it could be mistaken as a smudge, we see a diver floating. Picture instead for a moment the view from the 80th floor ledge of a New York City skyscraper looking down, where the streets and sidewalks and people below have been reduced to inanimate squares and moving docks. Are anything about these places particularly threatening? Does the vast chasm offer any threat of violence? The building? So then what is it about those things that can trigger such an instinctual and guttural fear in us? It's the same as an endless body of water and the fear it inspires in me. It's overwhelming nature. The idea that if you're lost in that chasm, you'll never be found. Or if you were to slip off that ledge, your chances of surviving the fall would be virtually zero. To me, that's the truly horrifying idea behind a zombie apocalypse. It's not that the undead would become some overpowered juggernauts of creatures, that doesn't really even make sense. It's that there'd be millions of them, maybe hundreds of millions, Maybe a couple billion. While critics of Romero zombies call them weak and easy to avoid, I can't imagine a stadium full of people would be easy to overcome regardless of their physical status. Regardless, Hollywood will run with what works at the box office. And with the success of a few movies in the 2000s such as 28 Days Later and the before mentioned uh, Dawn of the Dead remake, as well as Zombieland near the end of the 2000s, the page had been turned on the genre and we were treated with a ton of these overpowered zombies. Zombieland itself was particularly significant and it seemed like for years following its release, every zombie movie was a shallow attempt to recreate its magic. That's what led to movies like Cooties and Boy Scouts Guide to the Apocalypse and this year's Army of the Dead. They weren't all bad though. During this time we got Shaun of the Dead and Mulberry Street, and honestly even Zombieland had plenty to love about it, and this is where this all connects. As another exception of this time is the main focus of this video, and that's Robert Rodriguez's Planet Terror. Born out of the love for early grindhouse cinema, Planet Terror is an over-the-top, full-acceleration thrill ride. It's gory and funny and sexy and makes a great if not subtle point about the dangers in trusting authority. In these ways, it truly exemplifies all of the things that made the classics so great. And because it's done as an homage to cheap exploitation films, it at times even kind of looks like them. One of Planet Terror's strengths is its undying commitment to practical gore effects, much like Dawn of the Dead. It shares a more obvious connection as well as the man who oversaw the makeup effects in Dawn, Tom Savini, plays a cop who gets his fingy bitten off. The man in charge of those effects for Planet Terror, Gregory Nicotero, does an outstanding job in this film. He draws inspiration from some classic body horrors as well as some classic monster movies to create some truly unsettling practical effects. Hearing him talk about him and director Robert Rodriguez just kind of bouncing ideas for sight gags off of each other and doing them must have been a dream environment too. Planet Terror nails that too, its atmosphere. The tone throughout the movie is somehow effortlessly comedic and apocalyptic. It's reminiscent of the classic zombie movies and its unashamed embrace of messy fun. Gunshot wounds exploding long strings of blood with every single shot. The indulgent practical effects done for the melting man. The repulsion felt when Dakota snaps her wrist or that one zombie pops the pustule directly on Doctor's face. 
It's overindulgent, disgusting, borderline obscene fun, just like in the 70s and 80s. Furthermore, zombie movies are at their best when the world they exist in is immersive. Another part of what makes zombie movies so terrifying is that they don't exist on a, a different planet or in an alternate universe or something. They exist on this very planet. If the world's ending, it should feel like it. Having familiar locations like a hospital and a locally owned barbecue joint makes it feel more like a town we've been to or maybe even a town we currently live in. Having those places not functioning and possibly swarming with zombies adds to that immersion. Rodriguez also did an outstanding job writing badass lead characters. Ray and Cherry are absolutely sensational. Cherry is a down-on-her-luck go-go dancer and aspiring comedian who in a turn of bad luck has her leg replaced with a rifle. Rose McGowan actually improvised several of the most memorable parts of her character, including the useless talent bit that became such an iconic piece of this movie. Meanwhile, Ray has some kind of undisclosed violent past, and, and he's an absolute sharpshooter who saves everyone's life on at least one occasion. The last point I wanted to make was its social commentary. All good zombie films need a good social commentary. As I mentioned earlier, Planet Terror, in my opinion, has a subtle message about the dangers of trusting those in power or with a little bit of authority. Time and time again, we're shown examples of people abusing that authority. Dr. Block abuses his authority over his nurse, and strangely wife, Dakota, by attempting to kidnap her when he finds out she's been cheating. The police officers wanted to keep Ray restrained without a weapon, which would have almost certainly resulted in the death of every single character. Even in the end, when they seemingly make their way to the safe haven offered by the military, it turns out they were behind the entire thing and had been overrun with the infection themselves. This general mistrust of those with authority, and particularly militaristic forces, makes sense as part of a film written and released during the middle of the Iraq War, and they really brought that to life without playing it too heavy-handedly. And this speaks to the point I wanted to make with this video. The zombie genre and subculture has been commodified in the most boring and trite ways, and it's felt in every soulless Zombieland ripoff and every over-convoluted Walking Dead episode. The genre at its best is used as a backdrop to tell a story not entirely related to the Dead. Think Don's take on consumerism, Knight's take on race relations, these are products of their times, and that made them feel more alive. Ironic for a movie about the undead. <laughs> for zombie movies to recapture the glory they once so clearly had, they need to have something to say again. Oh, and stop making them lift cars and run and shit, that doesn't make any sense. Anyways, thank you guys for watching this, I put a ton of research into it. Uh, next Wednesday, I will be doing yet another whore you probably slept on with a criminally underrated 80s slasher, Intruder. Please don't forget to like and subscribe if you haven't already. I've got a ton more of these deep dives planned, so man, I hope this goes well. Anyways, until next time, stay safe and... It's so good! Oh!